Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, Curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're going to continue our series talking about conversions that the Navy looked into for the Iowa-class battleships. The Iowas were a great platform, however, the age of the battleship passed almost before they were completed, and so the Navy had these very expensive uh, very large ships that had high speed uh, and a huge reserve of buoyancy. So they looked into a ton of different uses uh, for the hulls of these vessels, both the two incomplete hulls that they still had on the building ways and the, the four hulls that they had already in service. Uh, in the end, funding meant that none of these major changes were ever carried out and even some minor ones were deferred. Today's conversion we're going to look at is a late 50s and early 60s uh, attempt to make an amphibious warfare ship not too dissimilar from the last video we looked at. Uh, check out this video on phase B or phase 2 of the uh, New Jersey's conversion in the 1980s. This is basically an earlier attempt uh, at designing this from the dawn of amphibious uh, warfare with specific dedicated aircraft carrying ships for this. Uh, for more information on these types of ships, commonly referred to as Gator Freighters, check out this video on USS Bonhomme Richard. So amphibious warfare was basically a brand new concept in World War II. Prior to that, armies did not assault defended beachheads. In World War II, there was a requirement for it, and a lot of new developments came about based on lessons learned throughout the war. And some countries attempted it and did very poorly. Other countries, like the United States, managed to continually improve. During the Korean War, uh, amphibious warfare played a large role as well, both in landing troops on hostile beaches and also evacuating troops. So the concept was here to stay in the U.S. military, and uh, the U.S. Marine Corps in particular continued to evolve it. And the addition of helicopters allowing you to project force beyond the beachhead uh, really made it difficult for enemies to fortify forward positions. And so in the 1950s and early 60s, the Marine Corps began looking at this double envelopment strategy where a dedicated amphibious warfare vessel uh, or task group with surface ships providing gunfire, uh, aircraft carrying vessels, and troop carrying vessels all converging on a beachhead to put troops ashore, um, they began to look at this concept as a way to both land troops on conventional landing craft that could hit the beach and even, uh, in some instances, continue to drive up beyond the beach, while also landing troops from helicopters simultaneously. So the Navy initially looked at a couple of their old uh, World War II era escort carriers. These ships were uh, converted from merchant hulls during World War II, uh, and the Navy had dozens and dozens and dozens of them. They had been great at transporting aircraft across the Pacific. They had been great at hunting U-boats in the Atlantic. Uh, but in the 50s and 60s, there were tons of these left uh, that, that were just sitting in mothballs. So the Navy took a pair of them uh, and, and started looking at this concept where you can use the hangar and the flight deck for aircraft and you've got uh, a decent sized ship you can fill with troops. Um, however, these early attempts, the escort carriers were too small, they didn't actually carry many aircraft uh, or as many troops as you like, and they were extremely slow. So, the Navy started looking at some of their larger hulls that they had sitting around. Uh, in particular, they looked at 
purpose building something. They looked at the Essex class aircraft carriers, of which there were a number around uh, following the war that never got modernized. Uh, and they looked at their remaining battleships, which were not otherwise being used. The battleships were intriguing to the Navy because they could do everything. Just like we talked about in the uh, phase two conversion video of the 1980s, they can provide their own gunfire support with some of their 16 inch and five inch guns being retained. Uh, they have a huge amount of space, uh, particularly back aft on the fantail, uh, where you could build a flight deck that could carry some helicopters. Uh, there, there was room to build a hangar with the weight removed from the aft 16 inch turret. There was room to carry landing craft, and there was a ton of berthing space for troops that could be temporarily embarked. And what's more, these ships are fast, uh, and they're heavily armored, uh, and they have adequate command and control facilities to be a flagship during an amphibious assault. So just like last time with the phase two conversion, the Navy really liked the idea of having all of their amphibious needs inside of a single ship. So, let's look at what this design would have been. The idea, like I said, you've removed turret three and you build uh, some accommodation and some hangar spaces and a flight deck with a single elevator. Uh, and the flight deck is more a landing pad for vertical takeoff vehicles, at this time helicopters exclusively. Uh, and on the sides of the ship, you've got room for a tremendous number of landing craft. So you can both put Marines in landing craft and put them in uh, helicopters to hit the beach two different ways. What's more, the Islas had a large enough reserve of buoyancy that they could carry a number of vehicles that could be loaded via cranes into the landing craft. Uh, retaining some of their 5-inch guns, uh, some additional light anti-aircraft weapons, at this point it would have probably been the 3-inch, either 50 or 70 caliber gun, uh, and their two forward 16-inch turrets. In the end, the Navy decided that a single ship doing everything would be a jack of all trades and a master of none, uh, and they had no shortage of platforms laying around. They already had a number of amphibious vessels and transport vessels uh, and gunfire support vessels, all surplus from World War II, so it, it wasn't an issue, even though it would have been a relatively cheap conversion. Uh, so in the end, the Navy did a stopgap measure and they converted three of their late war built Essex class aircraft carriers that because they were built at the end of production had never been modernized like the earlier built Essexes had been. So those ships formed the stopgap uh, and the new purpose built uh, LHPs became the forerunners of the modern Gator freighters. So the Iowas would have been a really good uh, transport. They could have carried 1,800 troops and 250 tons of vehicles. The Essex class ended up only carrying 1,650 troops, uh, and the later purpose-built uh, Iwo Jima class ships only carried 1,500. So the Iowas had greater capacity, they had greater uh, survivability, they had greater speed, uh, and they had greater firepower, and greater fuel capacity. It could be used to refuel transports uh, and destroyers if they did operate with other ships. However, retaining them as battleships meant that the Navy still had uh, premier shore bombardment units in the fleet. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments, drop them in the discussion section down below and we'll get back to you. If there's any other of the uh, Iowa class conversions you would like to see 
in the near future, let us know in the comments. Check the description down below for ways that you can support the museum and our YouTube channel. And remember to like, share, and subscribe so that you're notified when we put out more content. Thanks for watching.